Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you who, who have dialed in to our <coughs> investor call with the management of Cytomune Therapeutics. My name is Kane Akai, I'm one of the senior healthcare analysts here at Chardon. As call participants are aware, our focus at Chardon is on identifying companies that can generate exceptionally high long-term investment returns by creating shared value for society through disruptive innovation. Joining me on the call this morning from Cytomune, our Chief, Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Christina Coughlin, Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Michael Caliguri, and CFO, Alexei Kryloff. Welcome, folks. Thanks for having us, King. Yeah, so, so, so happy to have all of you. Before we get started, just some compliance issues. During this call, we will not be discussing Chardon research. Any discussion about research should be coordinated between a participant and their respective salesperson at Chardon. The recording of this call will be made available to clients after the call. By participating in this call, our speakers attest that they have made Chardon aware of any potential conflicts and they will not discuss any material, non-public or confidential information that they are aware of that may breach their legal, regulatory or fiduciary responsibilities to any parties. With that said, for anyone in our audience who'd like to submit a question to ask of management, please email it to me at knakae at chardon.com. So let's get started. Regulatory approval of CAR T-cell therapies in 2017 was a key inflection point for immunotherapy approaches that use live cells to attack tumors. Earlier this week, one of your mentors, Chris, Carl Jun said in an interview that with two of two of his CAR-T patients now 10 years cancer-free, CAR-T can be declared a cure. But CAR-T therapy has limitations. Safety and efficacy thus far really only for leukemia and myeloma, and even there it doesn't work for everyone, such as when patients already immunosuppressed from an earlier line of treatment do not have sufficient T cells to modify or stimulate, as well as the potential for significant side effects. For this reason, the attributes of NK cell therapies make it an area of high interest. So to kick things off, Christine, or Chris, I'm oh, sorry, could you spend a, a couple of minutes to provide a brief overview of Cytomune for investors who are new to the story? Sure, we'd be happy to. Um, let me uh, pull up some slides. Let me know when, uh, when you guys can see them. Um, at, uh, so at Cytomune, um, we are harnessing the tumor reactive NK cells, which is a I would say a relatively recent uh, term um, that, that cytoimmune is, is coining. As you mentioned, Kay, um, early in my career, um, the serendipity was when I was a first year oncology fellow, uh, Penn recruited Carl June, um, and I got to spend several years um, studying with him and, and working with him as, a, as an oncology postdoc. And so I started my career as a T-cell girl. Um, I'm a recent convert then uh, to the NK space. And so the, uh, the, you know, the, the overview of, of cytoimmune is that this is really disruptive um, technology and, and manufacturing um, that is ongoing in, uh, in our company, um, especially as you consider the whole of the NK space. And we'll take you through some of the science here. Um, the company was founded in 2017 um, on the proprietary technologies and, and science coming out of our two founders labs. Um, we have Mike Caligiuri here. Um, who is a co-founder um, with a long-term colleague, uh, Jin Wai Yu. Both are at City of Hope now. Um, we have a management team that has a track record um, of, of execution across uh, various cell therapy um, platforms. So we've really amassed um, some talent here and we will be a clinical stage company um, middle of the year with our first program in, in solid tumors in, uh, in non-small cell lung is our proof of concept indication there. And our second program active uh, with the IND filed later this year in AML. Um, so really looking at solid tumors and hematologic malignancies at the same time. We have two platforms at Cytoimmune. Um, the first one on the left is the track NK. And these are the tumor reactive NK cells that are then co-stimulated um, by an anti-PDL1 um, inhibitor. Now, we'll go through a little bit of, of the phenotype of these tumor reactive NK cells. They're quite different from um, an NK cell that is in the immune system tasked with hunting down um, and surveillance for viruses. Um, here, the, the first engineering um, step that we take is to engineer the cells to secrete high levels of IL-15 
we can then implement that cell either without, um, in the case of our first program, or with a car um, as a second edit. The second platform on the right is the coalescent platform, which brings forward then a third edit. Um, so these NK cells have three edits, single virus, so simple manufacturing. Um, and the third edit is for these cells then to secrete a bispecific killer engager, which brings forward then a second mechanism of killing, bringing in the endogenous immune response since the bike is secreted, um, but also dual antigen uh, targeting. Again, single virus. First program there is in multiple myeloma and the second will be in solid tumors. So that first platform that I mentioned really goes across the entirety um, of, of the cytoimmune pipeline. So we start with cord blood. These are are young, um, immature, but really highly activated cells that can then be educated as the bone marrow would do down either um, a, a pathway to see a transformed cell or a pathway to see a virus infected cell. So those cells that see tumors recognize a stress pattern. They traffic to the tumor microenvironment and have this elevated activation status, which includes expression of, of PDL1 allowing then a PDL1 inhibitor such as atezolizumab, um, any of these two, then function as an immune agonist. It's an extra step that we have in the clinic. A virally reactive NK cell has different cell surface activation receptors expression and, and wouldn't be expected um, to then react to tumors. What you can see on the left-hand side here is that this phenotype of the tumor reactive NK cell really matters. And it's, it's Quite simple what we're seeing here, it's, it's multiple activation receptors. You can see four of them in the green boxes there that are highly expressed on the surface of our cells. And that phenotype along with PDL1 expression then leads to a key point um, in NK cell therapy, especially in solid tumors, which is trafficking to the tumor microenvironment. Now these tumor reactive cells um, that we're able to engineer and, and manufacture for use in patients, key point here, trafficking to the tumor microenvironment. This is even without the expression of a car that you can see on the right-hand side. Second platform is the coalescent platform. And here, the triple edited NK cell, similar to our track NK, they can express a car. They'll secrete high levels of IL-15, that key survival factor for an NK cell in vivo. And then they will as well secrete a bispecific killer engager. This bike will target through NKG2D, and then on the, the second end, we'll have um, a targeting end for a second tumor antigen. So essentially here in yellow is the triple edited NK cell secreting that high level of IL-15, which will have effects, beneficial effects, in both the peripheral blood as well as in the tumor microenvironment. These cells can choose to kill through the car embedded in the cell membrane, but then the bike being secreted now with the IL-15, we'll bring in those various cells from the endogenous immune response. And so essentially bringing together dual antigen targeting, the IL-15 benefits in the tumor microenvironment and really bringing in the endogenous immune response. First program here is in multiple myeloma with two antigens. Second program will be in solid tumors. We haven't disclosed the antigens yet for this one, which brings me to the cytoimmune pipeline. What you can see there at the top, the first program to go to the clinic, which could, should get started in uh, the second quarter of this year, is the track NK. And these are these first cells are secreting high levels of IL-15, manufactured down that tumor reactive um, phenotype using our proprietary process. We'll get started with the monotherapy program and quickly pivot to the atezolizumab combination, where atezolizumab is going to have a dual mechanism of action. We know Atezo as, as one of the key PDL1 inhibitors, a checkpoint inhibitor, and also functions as an immune agonist with a PDL1 expressing immune cell, um, such as our track NK cells, which sends these cells into a whole other level um, of activation in vivo. The pivot in uh, the, the solid tumor franchise then will be to introduce the PSCA car. This IND will be filed in the first half of, of 2023. And what this brings forward then will be a, a basket trial, um, phase one trial and PSCA positive malignancies. We also plan on implementing the atezolizumab combination here for that same reason um, that a PDL1 inhibitor will function as an immune agonist. 
one of the um, different things about cytomune is really the the attention to solid tumors as well in parallel looking at how uh, hematologic malignancies. And so our first team program will get started a little bit later this year. Our second IND will be filed um, in late uh, 2022. And that will be bringing forward a tumor reactive NK cell that now expresses a FLT3 CAR um, in addition to secreting high levels of soluble IL-15. That will get started in a relapsed refractory um, AML trial. The pivot then in hematologic space um, will be to bring the first coalescent uh, program forward, and that will be a BCMA um, car coupled with the bike um, that will be targeting GPRC5D, a G-protein coupled receptor um, antigen um, in the multiple myeloma space. That will be a 2023 IND, and we will get started um, with that one um, in multiple myeloma in phase one. So I'll stop there. That's a brief overview um, of the company um, and we can move on to um, questions and, and discussing things further. Okay, great. Thank you for that uh, overview. So let's kind of go back to the beginning of your process. Your, your cell source is uh, umbilical cord blood. Can you describe the advantages of using this source compared to use it, utilizing you know, I, IPSC? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll get started and then I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to the real scientist on the call. Uh, Dr. Caligiuri, as you know, has been working on um, and studying the NK cells for well over 30 years um, and understands this cell um, really at a, at, a, at a fundamental level. But so I think of the cord blood um, as, you know, there's a couple of advantages here. The first is, is that you know, these are, are bone marrow derived NK cell. They're not, um, they're not generated in a lab. They start out, um, we start out with a selection process that really looks for a highly activated um, NK cell. They are somewhat immature, which allows us then to implement our manufacturing process to generate um, that tumor reactive NK cell. The manufacturing process here is, is fairly straightforward um, and is, is almost elegant um, in its simplicity. It's a 16 to 23 day process. Um, we expand them on our feeder cells first, which allows then high transduction efficiency. Engineer them at about day seven, they secrete the IL-15 straight through. Um, and Mike and Genoa have really created this manufacturing process again, creating that really highly activated um, NK cell. And so in contrast to IPSC, where we haven't seen um, quite the activation status, we're able to drive um, this phenotype um, of the cells that are then able to traffic um, to the tumor microenvironment, which we know is going to be critical um, as we plan on um, implementing these in the clinic. So, Mike, um, you give a great uh, overview. It's, it's really the activation status, the simplicity of manufacturing, but you can add to that. Well, and I think the other point you just mentioned, Chris, is the, the trafficking. So, you know, as you know, uh, there are going to need to be additional genetic modifications to iPSCs to get them to traffic to tumor, whereas I think you just showed quite elegantly in the data, and we've seen it with our PSCA car as well, that these cells, the tumor reactive NK and the car NK, are trafficking right into the tumor beds um, and showing large anti-tumor efficacy. The only other point I'd make, and I, iPSCs is a very important path to pursue scientifically, I think it'll ultimately be a longer term play because of the extensive editing that needs to be done. And it's not mother nature's NK cell, it's a different in, in ex vivo differentiated NK cell using uh, cytokines and technologies, many of which were fortunately developed in our own lab. So uh, uh, it's an important experimental investigation to go on. In, in the case of iPSCs, you're taking a single cell and, of course, generating it an infinite source. That's the good news. The bad news is there's a lot of DNA replication that occurs much, much more than you see in cord blood. And as a consequence of that, the possibilities of genetic damage, genetic disruption, genetic malignant transformation, along with the editing or viral transduction, just increases proportionately because there's so much replication going on. And... Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, I think the jury's out on, on, on the IPSC and how safe it'll be, but very important experiment being done by a very capable scientist. I just think it's probably going to be a longer term play than, than just as there's mother nature's T cell and we're taking it and just expanding and activating it. That's essentially what we're doing with this, this cord blood NK cell. 
Well, great. And, and just let me uh, expand on one of your comments in terms of the selection of the NK cells uh, from the, the cords that you have access to. I think uh, maybe previously you've mentioned maybe 20% uh, of those are, are what you take forward. And, and Chris, you said you're looking for, you know, early NK cells, but um, exhibiting some sort of activation. So is that in terms of um, different um, surface cell receptors that are already being expressed? And I guess we'll assume that these are not yet PDL1 positive cells yet. Correct. So it, it's a proprietary bioassay. Um, each of the cords that comes in comes with a small aliquot um, that we use for the bioassay. Um, in my clinician brain, we're looking for both quality and quantity um, of those NK cells in the in predicting what will come out of the final uh, manufacturing process. So it's looking at both the capacity of those cord NK cells to expand, um, but also for them to become that tumor reactive cytotoxic. And yes, the last step is is really you know inducing that PDL1 expression. It's the last activation marker um, that comes up. It is a proprietary assay, so we don't give um, very many details on it. And I, you know, I often call it a labor of love from our, uh, our founders, really looking carefully at, at what are those key biologic factors. Anything to add, Mike, there? You're, you hit the nail on the head. I would just say uh, to Kay's question that, and I think you mentioned this, that really only about 25, 30% of either blood NK or cord blood NK have the intrinsic ability to expand and then be transduced because they're expanding so well. And what this assay does is predict with a high degree of certainty as to which cords will do that. So before we get into the expansion, before we get into the activation, frankly, before we get into the time and the cost of the procedure, we can take an aliquot of the frozen cord, thaw it, put it in this bioassay, and within 48 hours know if it's a winner or a loser and so we can build a bank of winners. No, and, and, and another important point, um, you know, to tag team on, on top of that, Mike, is that, you know, one of the criticisms that cord blood NK cells um, get is that this is such a heterogeneous um, donor pool um, and that then, you know, creates a heterogeneous product. This is probably the best way to control for that. Um, really, if we're, we're picking the, the top, the best 20 to 30% of cords, um, we could show, you know, we can go back and, and look at those release assays that I showed, but essentially out of that, we get a really tight um, and homogeneous product. And that's from cord to cord um, be, because of, of this bioassay and the selection process up front. Okay, great. So, so now you, you, you're starting with the best of the best, let's say, of the NK cells. Uh, you do the expansion, you expose them to your feeder cells to send them down the path of differentiation that you've chosen, you expose them to IL-15 and, and the triple cytokine induction, the goal being to produce these PD-L1 positive NK cells, which importantly are also capable of secreting IL-15. So getting this phenotype um, with the potential for higher activation and communication with other immune cells in the TME. Can you expand on both those points, the potential for higher activation and the ability to secrete the IL-15 and, and what that does for it in terms of being able to communicate in the TME and, and switch perhaps the, the environment of the TME? Yeah, so one of the things that you can't ignore um, in, in cell therapy, especially effector cell therapy like this is in solid tumors is the tumor microenvironment. Um, and I think of the, the advantages of the tumor reactive NK cell, and um, I'm going to go quick and, and let Mike uh, jump in, but it, it's really, it's that activation status, the ability to kill a tumor when it, when it encounters it, the trafficking, and then the IL-15 is really important for persistence. Mike and Jinwa just published a paper um, in PNAS um, looking at some of the key pathways there. Um, but Mike, maybe you can expand. I, I yeah. simply think of it as those three things are critical. Yeah, no, it's a great question and it's hitting on, I think, some of the unique uh, uniqueness of cytomune. So one of the things you want to do is once your tumor has arrived and Chris showed just a bit of our data showing the trafficking, you really want it to do its thing to go ahead and lyse the tumor cells. And so how can we come up with a switch to do that? And as it turns out, we discovered and published in Cancer Discovery uh, 2019 
when we make PDL1 positive NK cells um, by giving a Tezo, which binds to PDL1, it not only blocks the PDL1, PD1, you know, and allows the T cell to wake up, but it also induces through what's P38 NF kappa B pathway the activation, and Chris used the term earlier, immune agonist, it activates the NK cell to explode with its perforin, its granzyme D, and its secretion of gamma interferon right in the tumor milieu. And we've, we've published this and shown this. So what you can imagine, you infuse the NK cells, they hone, you hit with the Atezo, and you've got the release of these. The second point you asked about K is that while those adatezo is in there blocking PD-1 and PDL one on the T-cell part, we're secreting IL-15 from the NK cells that are in the milieu. So you not only have the T-cell maybe waking up and preventing exhaustion, but now you've got some IL-15 around to further promote its anti-tumor response. So you get a twofer. You get the direct activation of the NK cell in the tumor bed, and then by blocking the PDL one PD-1, with IL-15, and Tom Waldman and Jim Allison showed this, it further activates the T cell uh, once its checkpoint inhibitor has been, been blocked. So uh, very, very exciting tumor microenvironment, the TME activation from this, this combination of NK plus the, the Tezo. So as I was digging in the, into this, I, I had a couple questions. Um, the first was, um, you, you've, you've en engineered these changes, you get this um, <clears throat> expression of, of different um, cell surface receptors that make it more active. And then you're gonna add in um, a TZO, in this case as an agonist. Uh, I guess the first, one of the questions I had is, does the um, constitution of the cell surface of the engineered NK cell that's now PDL1 positive, how does that, possibly change the affinity for a TZO to act as an agonist on those cells relative to um, its, its other job of um, <clears throat> silencing or acting as the checkpoint for the tumor cells expressing PDL1? Yeah, that's a great question. We've shown that the PDL1 on the NK is the same PDL1 on the tumor. And it's the same antibody with the same affinity and avidity. So as long as there's a plentiful antibody in the body, it's binding to both the PDL1 on the NK, activating it, but it's also blocking the PDL1 on the tumor cell. One of the interest, so to answer that question, one of the interesting things, as you may be aware in the lung cancer world, is that some patients who do not express PDL1 in their tumor have a response to a Tezo. And that's been a mystery. And in our paper, we explore that. There may have been an editorial written about it as well as, well, maybe it's the PDL1 one positive NK cell endogenously present in lung cancer patients that's getting activated to kill the tumor. And that's why you're seeing anti-PDL1 efficacy um, in lung cancer when there's less than 1% PDL1 of the tumor. Um, so it's getting the same binding and, uh, uh, by the antibody on the tumor as it is uh, on the cell. Okay, and then I guess the other question I had is, so now we're using a TZO as, a, as an agonist, and um, it seems to be uh, creating perhaps its own positive feedback loop in, in um, making the cells more active and perhaps, um, you know, just as I said, in a positive feedback way, making uh, <clears throat> them even more powerful. So two things, one, uh, how much more powerful do you think the, uh, the addition of a TZO will be in terms of their killing potential? And then I guess maybe on the, on the flip side, since we're using a TZO now as an agonist, what comes into play to act as a control uh, to you know, keep that, let's call it a positive feed lap, feedback loop? And, and from my engineering days, you know, that, those are unstable. Uh, what, what, what acts now as the control to keep that from... from from running, running away? Great question. And you're right, it is a positive feedback loop. One of the things the P38 pathway does, it not only releases the perforin and the granzyme B, but it also upregulates PDL1 on the surface of the NK cell. So to your very, very good point, um, it's, it's, there's positive feedback and this you know, could, could keep going. And so um, you know, whether 
like most cellular therapies, there will be ultimately, if one gets to it, if one needs to get to it, there will be a dose, uh, both with the Atezo and the NK cells, whether it's a billion cell dose, 10 billion cell dose, uh, there will be a dose where, you know, the release of perforin and granzyme B um, and, and the continued positive feedback loop without the dissipation of the antibody, which is pretty, you know, which sticks around for a couple of weeks, um, would lead to some toxicity. But we've not seen that in the mouse models. And as you know, NK cells alone have now been given up to a billion cells in patients, engineered NK, and much more than that, unengineered, without toxicity. So I think um, my guess is that the therapeutic window is going to be uh, strong and that, and that we're going to see efficacy, um, anti-tumor activity long before we see that positive feedback loop turning into uh, a toxic you know, response, in which case the dose would need to be lowered. Right. I'm going to channel my inner, uh, you know, former T-cell life. Um, you know, Kay, as you know, I, I was the chief medical officer at Team Unity. We were looking at autologous CAR-T in solid tumors. Um, the other advantage, um, and I, I use that term specifically for the NK cell, is that they're not going to last for years in right. the patients. They're probably not even going to last for many months in the patients. And so the ability to redose, um, for which we're going to have to drop the lymphodepletion um, somewhat, um, you know, it's a whole new way of, of thinking about, um, you know, applying NK cells in different ways other than, you know, these high dose flu psi um, that could be you know, implemented uh, to really in increase the persistence um, of the NK cells. I'll tell you one of the things that I find really compelling about the cytoimmune platform um, is the deep science that our founders, uh, Mike and Genoa, have, have put in, in terms of really understanding the these feedback loops um, and how we keep these cells um, in persistence. But they're not going to persist for that long. And so at the same time, we have to think about redosing strategies, which I think, you know, is important as we try to implement these in solid tumors. Excellent. Yeah. Point. And, and that yeah. leads to my next question is, but the changes do enhance the persistence, which you do want. So which of the changes are most responsible for enhancing and extending the NK cell persistence? So I'm going to let Mike take that one, um, but I will you know, just mentioned that a, a good bit of this data was just published in PNAS in terms of, you know, the, the feedback loops. Mike, why don't you give a, a high level of, of that paper? Yeah, thanks, Kay. You know, we were fortunate enough um, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago to discover that IL-15 is the survival factor, activation factor, differentiation factor for NK cells, human NK cells. And that, that's turned out to be proven over and over again. Um, what we've recently shown is that um, the NK cell furthers that survival pathway because once it is activated by IL-15, be it it's our engineered autologous IL-15, autocrine secretion of IL-15, or exogenously administered, it upregulates two important molecules. One is a ligand called PDG, PDGGF, uh, platelet-derived growth factor, and the other is platelet-derived growth factor uh, receptor. And so a second autocrine pathway begins, and that, sub, that um, uh, supplements um, the IL-15 pathway itself and further enhances survival. So IL-15 activates the NK, it makes PDGGF D, uh, one of the isomers, it's the D form, and it makes the receptor, puts the receptor on its surface, and that autocrine pathway further supplements the IL-15 survival, as well as binds to NKP44, which is Marco Colonna discovered NKP44, one of the activation receptors on NK cell. The ligand for it is PDGF. So tumors make PDGF, NKs make PDGF, and both of those activate and enhance survival. That's what the, the PNAS papers is about. So. Uh, so those are the molecules, to our knowledge, there's likely others that sustain in case of cell survival in vivo. And, you know, to Christina's point, they, the survival will be on the point of, you know, weeks to months. So it, it ultimately will, will terminate. Okay, great. So, um, Chris, you, you talked about the fact that you're about to go into um, 
uh, a study, your first study, uh, non-small cell lung cancer with a 102. And perhaps maybe you can pull up that slide and, and kind of walk us through the design there. And maybe importantly, talk about the logistics of, of your repeat dosing with your NK cells and how this possibly can um, uh, you know, reduce the, the lymphodepletion um, uh, pre-staging, if you will, that's required. Sure. Um, so you can see here, uh, there are within the same trial, uh, two different approaches, uh, really understanding the, the monotherapy activity of uh, the 102 cells, as well as in combination um, with the tazolizumab for exactly, you know, the, the dual mechanism of action. So there's a couple of things um, to touch on there, um, and then I'll dive into the lymphodepletion a little bit. Um, the first is, is that you know, these, these 102 cells, um, something that we completely glossed over, a, a key aspect of, of them, because we start with these highly active um, but immature cord blood NK cells, they actually, as they mature and are, as they're educated um, down this tumor reactive phenotype, they express really high levels of, of CD16. And so one of the aspects then, as we look at the monotherapy arm, is, is really building on that and, uh, you know, what are the monoclonal antibody um, combinations um, that we might be doing there. I would say that these are, are deep in discussion um, at, at cytoimmune, but they're understanding the, the monotherapy activity, really understanding are these cells doing in human patients uh, what they were designed to do, which is essentially secrete IL-15, which will impact both anti-tumor T cells, as well as, as the NK cells in the peripheral blood, as, as well as in um, the tumor microenvironment. But then looking again at the, the atezolizumab um, combination from there. So we're really looking at, at both of these independently um, and how they can drive the development um, plan for the 102 program. Then if we look at, at lymphodepletion and, and redosing, we're essentially going to be looking at each patient initially in the initial cohorts um, as, as their own control, starting with full dose flu psi and then dropping um, fludarabine, um, bringing the dose of, of cytoxan down. In terms of being able to redose NK cells, um, a lot of the toxicity really comes from the lymphodepletion regimen. This, this produces some grade four um, toxicities uh, in terms of the, hematolo the hematologic um, space. And so if we're able to reduce that, this becomes then a, a much more tolerable option for patients um, as we're able um, to redose. Now, if you think about it from the CAR-T space, um, the reason that we give lymphodepletion is to induce that homeostatic proliferation, increased expansion, you know, massive expansion that we get um, in CAR-T. It's a management of the tumor microenvironment, um, but it's, it's also, you know, really looking at that cytokine milieu. Each of these are important because the NK cells, as we manufacture them as cytoimmune, come, we don't need that massive expansion. They make their own IL-15, which induces expression of interferon gamma, um, and we have a play, as Mike described, in the tumor microenvironment. So we think that that is really, you know, going to be an, an option for us going forward. Um, Mike, you've uh, designed uh, the protocol, and, and those two aspects are important, the atezolizumab, um, as well as, you know, dropping the lymphodepletion. Um, but this is something that, that Mike and I connected over as I was deciding to take the job. But Mike, you know, you can add to that. Yeah, no, I, you've done a as usual, great job describing. So the idea is to dose elevate with the higher, higher doses of the NK cells in the non-small cell lung patient refractory to or resistant to relapse from chemotherapy uh, checkpoint inhibitor. And then, you know, at a, at, I think it's the fourth dose to go ahead and add the Atezo um, to look for that synergy that we believe we'll see and we've seen in our animal models as well. Um, you know, with regard to the uh, immunosuppression, we're starting with the standard uh, flu side, but as Chris alluded to, we believe that we will in subsequent doses be able to drop down the, um, this flu side, possibly just to cytoxin to get uh, a transient um, suppression because Remember, flu sci originally started to kind of clear out the bone marrow and get a resurgence of bile 15 to help the T cells. But in this case, every transduced NK cell we're putting into the body 
already has IL-15. So the need to really lympho deplete, so the body responds by a huge surge of IL-15 is no longer needed. So we believe we'll be able to drop down the lymph node depletion substantially. Great. So for either the mono, I'm sorry, for either the monotherapy arms or the um, <clears throat> combo with a TZO, what would be a, a good outcome? So the monotherapy, uh, as we get started and look at the proof of mechanism data, we really want to see that the cells do what we designed them to do. That's going to be the first data um, coming from the trial, understanding are they trafficking um, <coughs> through a biopsy uh, study? Is the IL-15 um, being produced? What are the effects in the peripheral blood? What are the effects um, in the tumor microenvironment? In terms of then proof of concept and, and really showing tumor regressions, it's probably going to be with, with the atezolizumab. Um, we've shown in the, the preclinical setting um, that animals that have both adoptively transferred T cells, so mimicking you know, a, a patient with a fully functioning immune system, as uh, along with our track NK cells with atezo, that's where we get really the optimal um, control of disease. Um, and so that proof of concept efficacy, those data will be deeper um, into 2023, but we hope to have mechanistic data um, from the trial really, again, understanding how the cells doing as they were designed um, early, in, uh, early in 2023 um, and being able to report are these NK cells. Because we do think that they're going to have um, some, somewhat of a, a different profile in the clinic um, than, uh, than other NK cells um, from, um, from other sponsors. Yeah, you know, I would just add, it's uh, interesting. Of course, this has been a couple of years in the making, but a year ago, there was a study out of China where patients with non-small cell lung cancer who failed platinum resistant were randomized to receive uh, PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor versus allo and K-cell infusions plus PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor. And Chris may be able to quote the data better than I, but there was a significant increase in overall survival to those patients. And it was a randomized study, about 109 patients. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And those patients who received both the ALO-NK and the PD-1 had a significant increase in their overall survival compared to those who received just the checkpoint inhibitor. And further, those who received multiple doses of the allogeneic NK cell had a, even a further significant improvement in their overall survival compared to those who received a single dose. And um, obviously that wasn't, a, it's not an engineered NK, no IL-15, not proprietary. I think they use supplemental IL-2 to the patients, but um, what we have is a proprietary product. And obviously we're looking to uh, even better uh, those outcomes, but very, very encouraging to show that cell therapy plus the checkpoint inhibitor in refractory lung cancer patients, chemo refractory, um, is, is better in, in, in what looks to be a beautifully designed randomized study. Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No. Okay, so Dan, you know, it is first demand. So, you know, what potential safety concerns might you be on high alert to, to possibly observe? So One thing the I NK would cells. Say, <laughs> Mike and I both like to answer this one. Mike, you can take this one. <laughs> I was just going to say a lot of, questions we get often, are you worried about toxicity from the IL-15? Right. Yeah. And the reason there's that concern is that IL-15 has been given as a single agent in the past, and you get um, toxicity with higher and higher doses of IL-15, especially when you get into the multiple and nanogram per mil uh, concentrations. One of the things that a lot of folks are, aren't remembering is that in those situations, the body is at homeostasis with IL-15. So IL-15, as I mentioned, is the survival factor for NK cell. And just like erythropoietin for red blood cells, IL-15 is that factor for NK. So if you have, let's say, 1.5 billion NK cells floating in your body, you got a certain level of IL-15. You put more on, there's nowhere for that IL-15 to go. The NK cells that are there have enough IL-15. And those that would be made over a longer period of time are taking their time to be differentiated. So IL-15 has to go toxic pretty quickly. 
with all the NK cells that we're putting in and all the IL-15 we're putting in, there's an NK cell that needs that IL-15. So we're not putting an IL-15 without billions of NK cells. And further, about half of the cells are transduced. So the other half are going in without any IL-15 and need it. So in other words, we have a sink for the IL-15 that's coming in with the billions of NK cells. So to your point, Kay, I'm not that concerned given the dosing that we're doing and the sink that we're creating for the need of that IL-15, of IL-15 toxicity. But that would be the one thing that we hear a lot about. What, what about that? You know, your IL-15 soluble, it's not membrane bound. It's like, yes, but there are a lot of cells coming in that need that soluble IL-15. Okay, so um, yeah, we obviously, everybody's gonna uh, really be looking forward to that data. Um, let's move on to um, 201, where you're now going to introduce the car. And I guess just maybe more top level, what have you guys learned or what are you able to leverage from all the work that's been done to insert a, a CAR T in the manufacturing and engineering involved uh, to insert a CAR T into a T cell? And now you guys are looking to apply that to an NK cell. Uh, Mike and I like to arm wrestle over this one, um, but uh, the, the preclinical data for this one was actually just published um, in uh, the journal Gastroenterology for the PSCA CAR program. Um, and I like to think of, of that publication, um, especially as, as you mentioned CAR-T and, you know, Carl and I worked for a few years on autologous CAR-T in solid tumors, trying to understand really how to use these um, when I was at Team Unity. So I've thought about this a lot. I think there's a couple of key advantages um, that are, are published in that paper in terms of, of the preclinical. Um, the first is, is a redosing strategy. And so what, um, what this paper shows, I think really, um, I, I think to, for the first time, is that if you pull these doses of the NK cells out to every few weeks, um, what, what Mike and Jinwa showed is, is more than four months of durable um, disease control um, in animals with PSCA positive um, pancreatic ductal cancers. Um, and these are systemic disease. This, this wasn't just you know, a, a flank injection. The next thing that they showed, um, which I think is important for the field is that a, a intravenous injection of the cells, the CAR NK cells alone, has a somewhat limited biodistribution. We can optimize the biodistribution by combining two routes of administration, which is intravenous and intraperitoneal. We've had multiple trials um, with CAR-T, um, many of them in, in ovarian cancer, looking at intraperitoneal dosing. Combining these two routes of administration um, in the clinic is, is gonna be very straightforward. Um, so preclinical data um, at this point, um, and the one thing that I always forget uh, to mention in this paper, which, which Mike usually jumps in, but really efficient trafficking um, of these cells to multiple disease sites on both sides of the diaphragm um, with both of those options um, in play. But this is, your, uh, this is your paper, Mike. Anything to add there that I missed? No, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's really exciting to see you know, metastatic pancreatic cancer um, under control in one tumor model, all human and cured in another tumor model, or at least long-term survivals. Um, and, and, you know, the trafficking is key. And I think that's something that's been missing. So I'm excited about pursuing this clinically. But to your point, Kay, about, you know, so the transduction, uh, we use retrovirus, not lentivirus. Um, it, we have transduction efficiencies uh, in the CAR and K that average from 50% to 85%, depending on the size of the construct. And as Chris mentioned, in our coalescent platform, we're putting in soluble IL-15, CAR, as well as a bike, all in a single retroviral construct. And again, we have 50 to 75% transduction efficiency. So it's been, that was a big breakthrough, and that's where the company got started. We patented retroviral transduction of NK cells in 2013, but that was, you know, less than 10%. It was the breakthrough was getting it in the CAR T range of 50% <laughs> and higher. That's when the company really started to take off. Okay, and, and 201 is not that far off from entering the clinic. Uh, what else do you need to complete there before, before um, um, we're able to get to that point? 
So 201 will actually go to the clinic um, later this year. A lot of that um, data are unpublished at this point. That's our FLT3 car, um, which is really exciting. So that's going to be our first heme program. Um, that'll be in AML. <coughs> the key proprietary nature um, to, to this program is that um, the, the SCFV, so the car was really fine-tuned, um, to, to almost ignore uh, the, the hematopoietic stem cells and, and normal tissue. And this is, you know, really, I, I think the, the, the big gain that we're going to see in the clinic here, um, you know, the published other programs targeting FLT3 um, see that hematologic toxicity. Hematopoietic stem cells and, and multiple subsets of dendritic cells actually express FLT3. And so we're anticipating in, in some of these effector cell therapies um, that there will be hematologic toxicity. Um, what, uh, what Mike and Jinwa did is really fine tune um, the, the car um, and the binding of the car to ignore the normal tissue, um, but really still having the potency um, that we need for, for, the, uh, for the car NK to actually recognize the tumor cells. Um, all preclinical, um, but using hematopoietic stem cells, really an, an elegant experiment um, in that. That one is, is submitted, um, but not published yet. Um, and yes, we expect to get started with that one. That IND will be filed um, later in 2022. Um, but an, an exciting program. You know, with losing the hematologic toxicity, it really opens up development options. Um, you know, we can use this as a bridge to transplant. It may actually have some activity in a, a relapsed refractory setting, just being able to redose, similar as, as we just described for the solid tumors. And, and being aloe off the shelf it, in yeah. a disease that has very quick relapse, it can be ready to go right after consent versus waiting for the autologous product to be made, during which time, you know, up to nine out of 10 patients relapse and become ineligible. So that becomes very cost prohibitive in terms of what we're, we've, we've made the product, but you're no longer eligible. So here the product's made, can be distributed to multiple sites, accrual can be relatively uh, brisk. So we're, we're looking forward to that. We've had great success with the freezing. Okay, great. Um, well, let's, let's move on to your coalescent design platform. And here you're really upping the, the innovation to a whole nother level. Again, as you said, Mike, using a single vector to engineer both the car, so addressing one antigen, and then the bike, the bispecific, into a single NK cell. Um, you know, talk about, um, you know, the flexibility, especially how you, you might intend to use the, the bispecific um, it, with, I, I, I believe your, your initial uh, target is multiple myeloma, but go ahead and, you know, give us some more detail here. So I, I let Mike take this one. This is, uh, this is just a, a brilliant program. Sure, I can just chat a little bit. Well, you've seen a lot of excitement on bike in multiple diseases from multiple companies, um, as well as the T-cell engagers, and a lot of excitement about NK plus bike. Um, but it's two drugs and uh, it's two processes, two manufacturing processes, and then you need a cytokine to sustain, you know, the, the NK cell. So it's really three. And so the beauty of this is that this is all encoded into a single retrovirus, which transduces quite efficiently into NK cells. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that, of course, the car works through a, you know, a, a zeta chain activation. And then the, in our case, the bike, the tail end of the bike is attaching to NKG2D, which works through kind of DAP um, activation. So you got two different activation pathways on an already NK cell that's activated by IL-15. And then finally, you have two different <laughs> antigens to recognize from this NK, it can recognize BCMA on a subset of cells, GPRC5D on a subset, but the majority in a pre-screen will have expression of both while some will have either. It prevents tumor escape. So two molecules to recognize, um, two transduction pathways to activate, IL-15. Um, and then finally, the NKG2D is also on CD8, T cell effector cells, gamma delta T cells, NKT cells. So it can, when the 
spike that is secreted binds to GPRC5D, it will then attach not only the untransduced NK, which are NKG2D, um, but the CD8 effector cells, the NK uh, T cells, gamma delta T cells. So um, you're getting more uh, cells to the party, if you will, by, by using this bike. So very, very excited about it. Preliminary data looks very exciting. It's clearly better than BCMA alone as an NK car. And, um, and we think it'll help prevent what ultimately is likely to emerge, which is a BCMA resistant myeloma coming out of patients getting just the BCMA car, not really seen much yet, but I think like the CD19 lymphoma, we're, we're likely to see that as well. So, and it's all on a single drug. So we're, we're, we're pretty excited about it, but Obviously, the proof will be in the in the in the, um, in the phase one study. And, and Chris or Mike, um, what published preclin data could you point people to if they want to dig into um, <clears throat> your coalescent designs further? We have published anything on it as we of yet? We haven't published anything yet. Um, I think be it's our deck. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're we're happy. Uh, we're happy to take through. I I will say. Um, the other thing that I think is exciting about the coalescent platform and the, the capital N and the capital T is that um, we've got even more data uh, using coalescent in, in T cells. Um, so yeah. you can create a CAR T that also then um, secretes a bike. Key point yeah. there is then, you know, you've got the, the engineered T cell, um, but you're also bringing in, um, we're having a number of, of ongoing uh, business development discussions around uh, the, the T cell aspects. Um, since we're, we're focusing on the NK cells. Okay, uh, well, we've got about uh, eight more minutes left here. Uh, let me ask uh, this question, Chris. Um, can you talk about your, your catalyst over the next 12 to, to 24 months? I think you have a slide that maybe lays all that out. I do, and yes, we're happy to talk through that. So the, the catalyst that, uh, that we've chatted through thus far, um, again, the first program, um, is, is going to the clinic imminently. These are the tumor reactive NK cells, the 102 program, going in first uh, without a CAR and monotherapy. That's really to set up you know, potential um, antibody combinations in the future there. Um, we're looking at that first mechanistic data, It'll probably be um, early in, in 2023. And that's really just to show that the cells are behaving um, exactly as, as we designed them to behave, um, secreting the IL-15, the effects of IL-15 in both peripheral blood as, as well as in the tumor microenvironment. As, as Mike mentioned, we've got data um, that it, it impacts um, in, in both places. Um, and then trafficking, uh, which we think is, is really critical uh, implementing an NK cell product um, in a solid tumor. The data, then the safety and efficacy data will be deeper into 2023 there. We will have uh, later in 2022, the first patient treated in the atezolizumab combination, um, that safety and efficacy data later in, uh, in 2023. Our next IND uh, will be filed late in 2022 and we'll get started with that AML trial. That's the FLT3 um, car, track car NK program um, that will get started. And then we have two exciting INDs in, uh, in 2023 that will be both the multiple myeloma um, as well as um, the PSCA CAR uh, program. Uh, we will have then a, a subsequent um, coalescent. Um, it will be in solid tumors. We haven't disclosed the antigens yet. Um, and uh, so as, as soon as we have a little bit more detail around that one, um, we're, uh, we're happy to, uh, um, to disclose uh, where we're going with the next step in, in coalescent. Um, I find that to be probably the most exciting part of, um, of the cytoimmune pipeline. Okay, great. Um, so, so Chris and Mike, um, you're not the only NK um, cell therapy development effort out there, but what have you guys been able to learn from, from other uh, NK cell development programs that you're able to leverage and proceed uh, forward in a more informed way? So I, I think I would I would start with um, you know the the discovery and it's it's multiple um, discoveries that have been made um, by our founders and and others. You can see um, on some of the scientific slides there's there's references to you know a, a lot of different groups that have contributed here. But this concept of a tumor reactive NK cell and really understanding what is the phenotype of an NK cell that is 
um, hunting and uh, you know participating in that immunosurveillance of, of cancers and able then to traffic um, to the tumor microenvironment. And what Mike and Jinwa have really figured out is, is how to manufacture that cell. It's not, you know, we're not editing in chemokine receptors or editing in any of the activation receptors in KG2D DNAM. We're actually producing that through a, a carefully curated manufacturing process. IL-15 um, is a key survival signal, but it has partners, PDGF and, and whatnot. And so, you know, it's through these series of, of discoveries that I think we've, we've, we're learning how to use the NK cell, not just in hematologic malignancies where, you know, we have proof of concept, um, but also we think that there is a key play um, for NK cells in the solid tumor space. There again, we're going to need trafficking, persistence, um, and strategies uh, for redosing. It's one of the things that I, I find so compelling about the NK. We can make, we can manufacture buckets um, of these cells um, with them being, you know, from different donors. Well, we think that we're going to have a much lower risk of, of host versus graft or the, or the allo reactivity that you might see with, with dosing a, a clonal population, something that we'll, we'll see in the clinic. Um, but I think that the, the cytoimmune um, strategy uh, and really how we're making the cells sets us up for, um, you know, potential to learn a lot and, and potentially succeed in, in both solid tumors and, uh, and hematologic malignancies. It's one of, one of the reasons um, that I'm here um, and really excited to develop um, the science of our co-founders. Mike, anything to add? You know, I've been in the field, as Chris mentioned, 35 years, my co-founder uh, together, or it's about 53 years combined. So we've seen a lot. We've trained legions of people, several of whom are starting their own NK companies. We learn a lot from our students and, of course, from our colleagues across, this, across the spectrum. And, and there's a lot of good science going on. I do think what we have, we've defined, I think for the first time, the tumor reactive NK cell. What does an NK cell look like when it sees a tumor? What is its phenotype? And then how do we make that cell and not make the other NK cells for viral, et cetera? And, and I think that's, that's where we're starting. That's our starting point. That's probably our separating us from others. And then with the creativity we've had with the, with the, with the constructs, um, both the track NK and, and then the, the coalescent and the cars, um, I'm, I'm excited about what we're doing. I'm excited about the field. And I think as Chris alluded to, you know, the NK cell, is the NK cell. We're not trying to make it a T cell. We're trying to complement T cell biology with NK cell. That's why both cells are still around in our bodies. Mother nature feels we need both. So we're, we're pursuing that. Okay. Um, let me ask you one um, capital structure question. You know, to the, you know, what can you say about your cash? And then also who are your um, primary investors at this point? Right, so we closed our first institutional round uh, in July of 2021. That was led by Sofanova Partners in Europe. Um, also participating there was Bijin as a pure um, investment and multiple, uh, the Myeloma Investment Fund as well. Um, when I joined back in the middle of November, um, we've reopened um, this private uh, funding round and I would say we're having some, some active uh, conversations. Uh, the number that we are Looking to add to that original 27 million that was closed in July is on top of that an additional 70 or 70 um, million. And um, it, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, potentially closing this um, in the next couple of months and uh, continuing to have a number of, of really good conversations there. That additional funding um, will then uh, keep us um, through to a runway deep into 2023. So, you know, the catalyst um, that I showed you will all be um, covered by this, uh, this next round um, that we're actively uh, seeking right now. I would, the only thing I would add is um, one of the unique aspects is we have our own manufacturing plant. We've managed to build that out in its entirety. Um, it's located in Puerto Rico. Um, we've got 40 folks hired. We've recruited an outstanding uh, chief operating officer from biotech in LA. And uh, very, very exciting. It allows us to control our destiny to a certain degree. So very excited about that. We've started our first GMP runs there and uh, moving ahead. Thanks, Mike. It's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> control of manufacturing is critical in cell therapy. 
yes, we, we, <laughs> we've seen how important that is in the last year or two. Um, all right, well, we've reached the end of our time here. I um, want to really uh, uh, thank both of you for joining us today. Alexia, I don't know if you're still on, uh, as well as all of our audience participants. Again, we'll have a, a replay of the call. Anybody that wants to have a further discussion with management, management we can facilitate that as well. So with, with that, have a good rest of your day, and, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank thanks you. again. Take care. Enjoy your day. Thank you.